This podcast is brought to you by the Albany Public Library main branch and the generosity of listeners like you. What is a podcast? God, Daddy, these people talk as much as you do. Razib Khan's Unsupervised Learning. Thanks for listening to the ungated version of the Unsupervised Learning Podcast. If you want to read some essays on some of these topics, please check out razib.substack.com. Again, that's razib.substack.com. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. Today, uh, I'm going to be talking about ancient DNA, which I know a lot of you guys are uh, super interested in. Uh, So I'm here with Dr. Elizabeth Jones of the Paleontology Education and Outreach. Uh, She is the Paleontology Education and Outreach Coordinator at the NC State uh, Museum of Natural Sciences. And she wrote a book, uh, which I did read over this weekend, uh, about a topic uh, that um, I am super interested in, Ancient DNA, The Making of a Celebrity Science. And I want to talk about the book and stuff like that. I I do want to tell the listener, a lot of my um, interest in ancient DNA is relatively recent. I mean, I've been interested in it for a long time, but I feel um, my attention to the field uh, from a scientific perspective, like reading the original papers, uh, really dates to around 2010, maybe a little earlier. Uh, whereas when I was, you know, much younger, um, I did hear about ancient DNA, but mostly in stuff like the New York Times Magazine or Scientific American, you know, more secondary stuff. So it was interesting to read the book because it goes back into kind of um, the Paleozoic of ancient DNA, so to speak, <laughs> um, where you know, kind of the pre-genomic era of ancient, which was. Um, and we'll talk about it. I think you call it the first hype cycle in the book. And I do remember that. And the reason I reached out to you is you tweeted something out um, about something in the New York Times Magazine. And I very specifically remember reading this in like seventh or eighth grade, um, dating myself here. But uh, I think my science teacher was uh, printed it out or did like a ditto copy or something like that. And I remember it. I think it was super interesting that I didn't like think about it too much, obviously, for I mean, honestly, for another 15 or 20 years, went off, did other things with life. And then um, it's kind of been in the back of my ha- my mind, so it kind of like triggered it again. So the, the subhead uh, of your book uh, is the making of celebrity science. So before I read the book, um, I was wondering if it was going to be focused on celebrities in science, kind of like uh, Pablo, Swante Pablo, David Reich that make appearances, other people uh, in the 1990s uh, show up, you know, like, most listeners or viewers will know Alan Wilson, big deal outside of ancient DNA, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not what you really mean by celebrity science. Can you talk about that, Dr. Jones? Yeah. So celebrity science is this new term that I created to give a framework to the history of ancient DNA research, but also um, as a framework to look at other sciences, not just ancient DNA. And so celebrity science is um, a scientific field that develops, grows in the media spotlight with a lot of intense public interest um, and media exposure. And the key thing about a celebrity science is that it operates, to use some scientific evolutionary terms, on the group level. It doesn't, it doesn't mean there aren't celebrity scientists, perhaps within that celebrity science. So you mentioned Savanti Pavo, uh, David Reich. Um, I think some others might argue for Eski Willersliv. Um, there are a number of people, um, but I'm, I'm not making the argument for any of the scientists within ancient DNA research as celebrity scientists. I'm arguing for the subject of science that these researchers are interested in. And that is the act of extracting and sequencing DNA from ancient material. Um, And it's the public interest around that subject that uh, is what drives it and makes it into a celebrity science. So something comparable could be like astronomy or uh, forensic science too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say, um, you know, because I've, I've thought about this over the years, uh, and you know, I have friends that edit science magazines and cosmology. That mm-hmm. is, the I mean, people know a lot more about cosmology than solid state physics, mm-hmm. but arguably, solid state physics has a much bigger effect actually uh, through chips and stuff like that in our lives. Mm-hmm. But nobody, I mean, most people wouldn't actually know what it even is. But cosmology, most people know the Big Bang theory, they know galaxies, stuff like that. And mm-hmm. obviously, in um, you know, paleoanthropology, 
you know, I'm super interested in it, but it cuts a much bigger figure in the public imagination than many other areas of anthropology or biology, because while it's about humans, mm -hmm. uh, the human past, you know, we're humans, so we, we care a lot about that. And so um, you're talking about ancient DNA. I mean, to some extent, there's a little bit of talk. There's talk about proteins in there, too, so um, mm -hmm. we can get into that. But can you um, kind of give a general sketch of the history of this field? I Really, I mean, you know, you mentioned Jurassic Park. Um, I know there was some stuff before, but really, to me, it seems like that particular movie is kind of like a landmark where interest in this sort of stuff really exploded in the public consciousness. And I do remember um, the, the media representations of this field always had to have a Jurassic Park reference in the 1990s. I do remember that. Mm hmm. Yeah. So the great thing about um, history, so caveat, it's not all, it's all not date. It's not about dates and names all of the time. That is part of it. But when writing history, we have the advantage of uh, chronology. So um, I look at ancient DNA research from um, the 1980s to, well, in the book about uh 2015, um, cause that's when I stopped doing the research and then it took a good five years to rewrite it and edit it. And I had to actually rewrite the conclusion right before I sent it into the editor because it's changing all the time. So if you're starting the conclusion with what's the oldest DNA, a new discovery came out, um, and I had to rewrite it. So, um, it's easy to date myself, but the chronology goes from the eighties, the nineties, and then the early two thousands. And, um, it's also marked by the technological advances. So the first one being PCR, polymerase chain reaction, um, that coming out at the end of the 1980s. And then that is the main technology that took ancient DNA research through the Jurassic Park era, we can call it that, um, in the 1990s. So the book 1990 and then the movie 1993 and then all the subsequent movies after that. Um, also followed the field. And then in the early 2000s, you have the um, development of next generation sequencing, which really um, came at a could not be more perfect time for ancient DNA researchers because they were struck stuck in the within the limits of what they could do with PCR. And NGS really changed the game and allowed them to do a lot more with um what little DNA they had, and it took them into the genomic era. Um, and so we're looking at um, about three decades of um, moving forward and moving back um, with what scientists think we can do as far as what kind of material can we get DNA from. So um, tissues, muscles, um, perhaps bone, um, and then looking eventually into the environment. So environmental DNA, and um, also microbi microbiomes. And then um, they're also pushing the limits of how old can we go. So that's one of the real real driving themes, um, not just in the media, but really what a lot of researchers were trying to do. How old can we go? How old can DNA be? Yeah, that's a that's a it's a biophysical question, right? So obviously, mm -hmm. it's a ro it's a robust macromolecule. But uh, you know, uh, at some point, you know, time catches up to everyone and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but it depends on what the thing is. And so the structure of DNA, I mean, you know, I don't know, you probably have talked to people. Um, so when I talk to scientists about this, they usually, so there's a mammoth, you mentioned a mammoth uh, DNA, I mean, obviously, where a mammoth's going to be, uh, relatively cold, kind of dry. Uh, so it's like optimal preservation. I think they now have dated it last I checked to a little over a million years. So mm -hmm. uh, my understanding is, or not my understanding, what most people say is, uh, you know, they're, prob they're probably going to get something in that range, but they don't seem to anticipate it's going to get much further than a million, uh, maybe, mm -hmm. but we're not going to get to 10 million, probably not three, you know, I mean, just like talking to people. That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be different with proteins. So mm -hmm. proteins are more robust and, you know, you allude to proteins like you talk about proteins. I mean, obviously it's a book mostly about DNA. That's the sexy molecule, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, proteins are very robust. We're probably going to get into the Miocene, you know, 10 million years, whatever, pretty confidently what I hear uh, with proteins. So that's a slightly separate issue. 
But um, yeah, so I mean, Jurassic Park was a major influence that would be the hook. And you're talking about polymerase chain reaction, just for the, the listener out there. Basically, before PCR, uh, it was really hard to get enough DNA to do anything, um, even with modern contemporary uh, things. So that's why the original mitochondrial Eve, they had to get the tissue from placenta, because that's a, a massive amount of DNA that they could use. Uh, this is pre-PCR age. Once you have PCR, some of the rate limiter for um, for the amount of tissue you need is removed. Obviously, with ancient DNA, you have a lot less tissue, so that makes a big difference. And then you bring in next generation sequencing, which is basically okay. We generate way more data off that amplified DNA, so it's kind of a multiplicative, um, you know, multi- it's it's multiplicative in terms of by two thousand five. Would you agree with that characterization? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. You saved me the saved me the <laughs> <laughs> the energy of explaining it. <laughs> that was well, you know, okay. So here's the thing. Whenever um, whenever I talk to people about biology or genetics, uh, obviously PCR comes up, and yeah. you're actually you were pretty good about saying it was polymerase chain reaction, but it's just like such a background condition of our world that we don't uh-huh. define and what it right. means to normal people. And so I I have to do that because, like, I have gotten that feedback where, like, why are you guys Mm -hmm. talking about PCR? I don't know what that is. I don't know crap, you know? Yeah, no, it's a great idea. I mean, we take it for granted. And that's what's that was what was incredible about interviewing um, the scientists who work in this field, because like Russell Higuchi, for example, who was on the very first, well, one of the very first ancient DNA papers with Alan Wilson. I mean, he remembers the the labor and the time intensive uh, process it was to just get, I would, would they get something like 35 base pairs of DNA from a 140 year old um, quagga, which is a zebra like relative of the horse, a really cool animal that they're actually trying to do some backbreeding with and having some success to repopulate um, in Africa. But I mean, it was just, it blows your minds because you take it for granted and it took days and days and weeks of just doing something that we can do now without even thinking about it. Yeah. 35 base pairs. I mean, (laughs) it's wonderful, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, I'm laughing. Like some of you who like listen to the audio will not see. I just, it's just weird to think about what we can do. I mean, that's what's so exciting. Uh, You covered in your book, um, you covered a field obviously from the beginning to, to the mid teens, as you said, but uh, in terms of data generation, went up two to three orders of magnitude at mm-hmm. least, you know? So it was like, you're seeing the explosion of the whole field. But some of the early things, uh, some of the early studies were interesting because, you know, this is a, a field fraught with controversy. Now, I I can talk about the field after, say, like 2005, in terms mm-hmm. of like coming into the genetics world as, you know, in grad school and all that stuff. Uh, I don't remember, I mean, I read about it sometimes in books like yours, um, I don't remember the 1990s in that way. I just remember it as a normal person, you know, a kid uh, reading about it. And there was a lot more controversy than I knew. Um, you put some of the details out there in terms of contamination and stuff like that, because it didn't really I don't feel like it hit the public consciousness. We just saw the headlines, uh, the first publications, the first pass, and then it kind of just faded away. And the reason it faded away is because of, you know, frankly, contamination and like a lack of confidence in some of the results okay. that were coming out. Can you talk about that a little? Yeah. So um, this idea of contamination to explain if you might not be familiar, um, not you, but listeners, um, that the idea of contamination, at least that's how I describe it, is both um, literal contamination of the ancient samples. So perhaps um the ancient sample can be contaminated with modern DNA from scientists handling it or um, just other um, organisms um, in the environment contaminating it. So it's really hard to tell if you've got the real deal. Um, And then also I say there's figurative contamination, and this is where the media comes in. And I want to be really clear that as a historian, I'm not saying that the media is a negative influence, but I'm saying that a number of scientists perceive that too much media or um, um, unjustified media attention around certain studies could see could be a contaminating factor on the credibility of the science. And so, yeah, exactly like you said, um, a lot of this really played out um, internally amongst the scientists um, 
across the scientific papers, um, at conferences. Um, but what really the public saw was um, this what can we do with ancient DNA being played out and the media picking up on that? So how old can we go? And a number of studies saying we can obtain dinosaur DNA or we can get DNA from insects in amber that are multi-million years old. And then um, other studies um, questioning it or either backtracking on it. And that was what really um, played a role in decreasing not just the scientific community's confidence in ancient DNA, but the public's confidence in ancient DNA of being able to do the Jurassic Park thing as they knew it. And why that mattered is that it wasn't just this um, internal amongst scientists, like we're having some issues. We don't believe your kind of work because you don't do these kinds of precautions or use these kinds of techniques, but it was playing out across the media too. And the public was aware of this and involved in it um, as readers. And so that's what was really complicated um, about the history of ancient DNA and why it was so contentious. It was like a public affair, not just a private affair. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, um, you know, your book uh, was detailed about the first dinosaur DNA. I didn't remember the dates. I just remember dinosaur DNA and I remember the buzzing in the class as we were talking about it. <laughs> and I mean, this is, you know, I mean, DNA is part of our lives in a way that uh, it wasn't in the 1990s. It was still an exotic. Um, I, so, OK, here's a some of the listeners will know this. But um, the first time I heard the word uh, I heard deoxyribonucleic acid defined was in an episode of G.I. Joe. Uh, in the late <laughs> 1980s, like because I had never read the whole. I knew I seen DNA, I'm sure, but I hadn't seen that ever spelled out. It was Sergeant Slaughter had said it, and I was like, "Whoa, that's a cool." Anyway, it was just it was really really different back then. And so, um, you know, DNA, dinosaurs. Um, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that this is going to blow up culturally. And so it was a big deal. And we were. I mean, I remember talking to my best friend about, you know, what are we going to do with the mosquito DNA? And like people were feeling that it was going to happen, um, at least to get the DNA. Now, of course, this is early days of PCR, early days of this whole field. And so actually, we were way more optimistic. Our expectations were not, um, they were not you know, calibrated appropriately, you know? And I'm speaking now as just a person on the street who doesn't know the science at all, because that's what I was back then, you know? And I think, I was, you know, I was reading Scientific American. I wasn't like the typical Joe off the street. So I think I knew a little bit, but, you know, I'm just telling you, like, I remember like very specific, it's like light flashbulb memories. Like I remember conversations, like after playing basketball with my friends and we would talk about like, yeah, like we talk because Jurassic Park was huge, you know, um, it's, and there are no movies like that actually today, like these sorts of culturally transformative blockbusters, because to be candid, our culture is a little bit more derivative. We're doing the comic book movies over and over again. And the 27th sequel of fast and furious, you know? So I just want to make it clear for you young people out there, uh, <laughs> what a big deal it was back then. Okay. So, um, you know, there's 80 million, I think it was 80 million year old DNA, um, supposedly, can you talk a little bit, can you go into the details of what happened there in terms of it was published and it was public. this stuff was published in science and nature. Okay. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an obscure, no offense, Bulgarian, you know, whatever, uh, entomology journal. Okay. I get that from like a mentor of mine. He'd always say Bulgarian entomology, but anyway, um, but it was like, it was pretty high profile and it was in peer reviewed, you know, publications, you know, the top ranked ones. Can you talk about what happened there? Right. So when we're talking about dinosaur DNA, let's there there are two different um, approaches that scientists really pursued in the late 80s, early 90s. So um, either the, the first being getting DNA from an insect preserved in amber. So to clarify, the scientists involved in these studies, so a number of them, um, a group in California, um, a group in New York, and then also a group in London who was trying to verify some of these results. So they they were not trying to get, well, most of them were not out to get dinosaur DNA from these insects and ambers, but they, they were, in a sense, testing this Jurassic Park hypothesis. Um, and um, the group in London 
who actually, um, what did, what did they say in their paper that they, um, they, they failed, failed in every instance to replicate, to extract and sequence, um, identifiable DNA from insects in amber. Um, their research was funded by the UK, um, by the, uh, in an ancient biomolecules initiative. And in their application, they said, you know, we are here to test the Jurassic Park hypothesis. So there's a pretty clear, um, you know, exceptionally clear link between uh, the, the cultural um, influence of Jurassic Park into the science um, and then the science putting back out to the public what we can and can't do. So um, so you had a number of studies in the early 90s saying we can get multi-million year old DNA, I think 130 years from an, um, an ancient weevil, um, something cute like that. And um, but, you know, at the end of the 90s, you know, there were reports that said, you know, red lights on on DNA on the Jurassic Park DNA. Uh, we can't we can't get it in the sense that maybe they did get it and it was a fluke or a one one off. And that's the hard thing with the d- DNA is like you may have it, um, ancient DNA. Sorry, you may have it, but it may only be a little bit preserved in that one specimen from that one area. And it's really, really hard to get that type of preservation in in other instances and to show that it is a um, more um, prominent phenomenon. Now, the other thing is getting dinosaur DNA from actual dinosaur bone. Now, that was way more far-fetched, but people tried to do it anyway. So um, there are a number of instances, and one of them, um, Mary Schweitzer and Jack Horner, who um, I know well and worked with, you know, they were my supervisors, um, in the, in the early 90s, um, 1993, they actually wrote a ap- grant application to the National Science Foundation to try to look for DNA from dinosaur bone. Um, and it was granted the summer that Jurassic Park was released. And there was also really clear um, communications um, from National Science Foundation personnel that said, you know, what a great opportunity to showcase the science. We funded it because of this, you know, connection with Jurassic Park to see what we could do. And, um, you know, they were unsuccessful in getting um, any identifiable DNA from the bone. And um, there were a number of other studies that said they did. And then turned out it was uh, human DNA that had Mm -hmm. been um, amplified. And that was a really that was a real showstopper (laughs) for the field. Um, It really set back uh, the scientific community's confidence in in Mm -hmm. what people could do. Yeah, one thing I want to um just to, as as I was reading it, uh, I think uh, it does also be before next generation sequencing, and we'll get into that. Um, you know, the amount of data, the amount of sequence retrieved, uh, was often. I mean, the supposed sequence, okay, the putative sequence, uh, was very small. It was not too many markers, so it was also sometimes it looked like it was hard to do the phylogenetic comparisons necessary mm-hmm. to actually figure out what this was supposedly from. So, you know, today we can do really, really fine grained analyses, you know, like 30, 40 million, 40 million Americans have 600,000, at least 600,000 DNA positions through the personal genomics, you know, kits. Okay. Like, I mean, we're talking like a handful, dozens of markers. So you can imagine the statistical robustness there. So there are all sorts of of problems validating uh, what happened uh, during this period. Um, And so there was a rollback. And it looks like there was a concerted rollback. So most of most most people will know who Svante Babo is because he is a Nobel Prize winner now. Um, and he wrote the book Neanderthal Man, and he's just become a massive, massive deal. And you know, when you when I originally uh, got your book and I saw the title, you know, obviously I initially thought that the celebrity was going to be about the people. Uh, but you know, you had a different definition of this like public science and this group cultural phenomenon. Okay, but Svante is now a celebrity. Uh, he is uh, maybe not the average person on the street, but the name will ring a bell with a substantial proportion of the public. But um, And he has been passionate, and he's talked about it. He was into Egyptology. Uh, he's been in this field forever. You know, he was, I think he was in Alan Wilson's lab with, you know, Alan, uh, 
with Cooper and a bunch of, uh, you know, I think Alan Cooper. And then I think Stone King was in that circle. I mean, these are names that um, people who are interested in the past will know. Okay. In terms of like human evolutionary genomics, genetics, as it's applied to the past and, you know, phylogenetic inference, all these things. Okay. But um, the role that he and some of his collaborators played in the mid to late nineties uh, was kind of different. Uh, in terms of they were more low profile technicians that were kind of throwing cold water on a lot of these things, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, we we absolutely have to talk about the people um, because the people are um, the agents of of change and of new ideas and pushing them forward, or like you said, rolling them back. So, um, I yes. So I would there. There were two um, groups. Um, these are self-ascribed groups of researchers. So when interviewing them, um, researchers on both sides of the um, divide or the ancient DNA world um, recognized this split in the community. Um, you know, on one side you had uh, the believers and the non-believers, um, or the haves and the have-nots. And so the believers were um, a group of people who. Um, the, the more conservative scientists would say had um, didn't have the proper protocols or proper know-how to do ancient DNA um, well. And um, the, the, the non-believers um, who, who would be people like um, Alan Cooper, Hendrik Poinar, Savanti Pabo, um, they were um, not just um, big powerhouses in the scientific field of ancient DNA, but they also had a lot of political sway in the sense that they were publishing high profile research. Um, so they, they were being, um, they were being risk takers and they were putting themselves out there in the media, like going after Neanderthal DNA and then the Neanderthal genome. Um, but they were proponents of their type of science and their type of celebrity around that science. And they were opponents to other people's um, research that didn't, that didn't match the caliber of research that they felt that they were doing and that needed to be done in order for ancient DNA research as a field to be credible, to be accepted in broader evolutionary biology. Um, and so what was interesting is that because the media was picking up on these publications about uh, dinosaur DNA or multi-million year old DNA, people like uh, Alan Cooper, um, Savanti Pabo, um, and Mark Stokine, they they couldn't just sit back and let it let it ride and ignore it. So they responded to it, both in interviews um, with the media um, and then also in scientific publications. And so in, at the, in 2000, you have this landmark publication by Hendrik Poinar, who actually worked on some of the early um, amber insect uh, DNA work with his father um, and some other scientists. Um, and then Alan Cooper, um, who was a big figure, a big controversial figure, um, especially as we know now, um, uh, at Oxford. And they published it in Science, and it basically said, ancient DNA, do it right or not at all. And it listed these nine, um, nine uh, techniques or precautions that any researcher needed to implement in order for their results to be considered rigorous enough or perhaps believable. and. Um, this became um, inadvertently um, a checklist, and it it was a gatekeeping process essentially that kept the people who were doing different type of research who weren't following these perhaps protocols um, as strictly um, as others. It kept them from getting published in journals like Nature and Science and from getting research grants. And so how scientists responded positively or negatively to the media had a really big impact on what others in the field were able to do in terms of research and where they were able to get it published. Yeah, so the... <laughs> 
um, scientists in the media. That's a that's a diff- different book. Uh, it's a, a another hundred PhD theses. I don't you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, it's like it's a, it's kind of a love hate relationship. I is what mm-hmm. I would say. Just privately, uh, that you know, there are some people who shall uh, to protect the innocent. I will not name, but you know, people who complain about other scientists. Um, using the media, and then when it comes time for their publication, I notice some hypocritical behavior. But I mean, sure. you know, when when it's your lab, when it's your collaborators, you want to maximize the juice, right? So it's a coordination right. problem, and everyone everyone gets involved in this game. But um, in a way, I would say that it's actually like a, you know, it's a positive. You know, even if it was a li- if people took it as a checklist, it's almost a positive development that science can actually work because there was a massive hype cycle in the 1990s, and the people that really put a lid on it were the scientists, right? Mm-hmm. That's right. I mean they they did not they didn't they were not like allowing it to get uh, they did not allow themselves to get caught. well. They got caught up initially, but then they were like, wait, 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 hold up. You know, so it was kind of like, I see that. I think that's how I would describe it. And then you mentioned, you know, 454 technologies, um, and next generation sequencing. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't need to get into like the details of what next generation sequencing is. You could go check out some YouTubes, everyone online. That's the easiest way, in my opinion, to like actually like see how they do it. Mm-hmm. But basically, this is just describing, um, okay, like you can generate data in an automated way very, very fast. You have these like uh, shattered DNA, these little you know, fragments and computers are reassembling. Uh, literally, they're reassembling. They're assembling uh, the sequence and then you're aligning it. Okay. And you're taking this and you're mixing it with these molecular biology wet lab techniques. Uh, Pabo, Willerslev, in particular, um, you know, in, in the last 15 years have really pushed um, the clean rooms and getting the DNA free of contamination. There's also issues related to, so, okay, um, DNA contamination, degradation, there are certain statistical signatures biomolecular in a biomolecular sense, like which tends to degrade and blah, blah, blah. Use computers to filter all this. So you can understand it as a human being, but actually for human beings to do this would be extremely laborious and probably like, you know, you'd have to be the pharaoh of Egypt and be, you know, okay, like everybody in my kingdom has to do this because you can't compute it fast enough without, mo- you know, without modern technology. So the technology really enabled it. And so you have this like next wave of DNA studies. Uh, you know, arguably the, there's a Neanderthal mitochondrial study from 1997, but there was a bunch of follow ups in the second half in 2005 to 2010. So can we go through, say, I don't know, like there was a cave bear, I think in 2006, and then it, you know, culminates with uh, Neanderthals and Denisovans in 2010. A lot of this is actually centered around uh, Svante Pablo's lab, although um, I think Eske Willerslev got the. Um, that uh, Arctic, the Arctic person, the Sakak individual, a mm-hmm. little ahead of the Neanderthal. Um, mm-hmm. The timing is not coincidental. We don't need to go into that. <laughs> there's like a whole, <laughs> there's a whole thing about the, the the race. I mean, that's how. So I mean, like, I don't think it was like highlighted in your book. But, I mean, there is like a book to be written about the race to sequence and get ancient DNA because that's what it's become or it became for a while, right? So, can you talk a little bit about the second hype cycle and what mm-hmm. happened there? All right. Yeah. So the second hype cycle, how how it's, you know, parallel to the first one of the 90s is, you know, it's in the 90s, you have the race for the first DNA from whatever specimen, mammoth, dinosaur, whatever, um, or the race for the oldest DNA from whatever specimen. Um, and then once you have next generation sequencing, it's not just about uh, so a few DNA sequences is about the first genome from whatever species and or the oldest genome from whatever species. And um, the people who were really driving that um, were, were not just people that are clever um, and resourceful, but they have res- resources to do the research. So uh, Next generation sequencing technology, the machines that are needed, the labs that are needed, the um, types of people that are needed to um, analyze the data once you actually produce it, um, all of that is really, really expensive. Um, And so you have to have financial resources in order to be able to access that kind of equipment in order to do those kinds of studies. So Savanti Pabe was well equipped at the Max Planck Institute. Um, in Leipzig, um, and then in Copenhagen, Tom Gilbert, Eski, and uh, Ludovic, um, when when he was there, um, they had really great funds um, 
to support their really great ideas and their ambition. Um, and so, yes, you get this um, hype cycle of, and and then also I, I want to be clear that you know the hype cycle in in my view um, as a historian of science, but also as, as a person, it is not. Um, like the media, it is not a negative. Um, it is a, if you look at the history of science in the long view, it is a, um, what perhaps we could say a natural process. Um, science is about asking questions, figuring out what you can do, um, failing, moving forward, figuring out what you can do and doing it again. And it's often triggered by um, new ideas and new technologies. And what we're seeing is in a pretty short span of time, two hype cycles um, going on in about, about about 30 years. And there's a lot of parallels, but there are a lot of differences. And in the second hype cycle, a lot of it is about, um, can we get genomic data from humans, um, or ancient, early humans, and mm-hmm. then the Neanderthal, and then also, you know, people we didn't even know exist, um, the Denisovans, um, which that genomic data was produced from like the bone of a pinky, mm-hmm. uh, pinky bone, which is absolutely insane. Um, and so you're, you're getting this now we've overcome the limitations of PCR and our Jurassic park days. And now we've really entered into, um, the, the real world of evolutionary biology and we can do what, uh, other evolutionary biologists can do and, and more. Um, so that is the tone that was set for, you know, the genomic era, um, genomic era in ancient DNA research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, I, I, this isn't like gone too far, but, um, the, so the, the, the British, uh, you know, they have all these ancient, I mean, it's cold, uh, I guess there's preservation. They invest a lot of it, you know, a lot of time into it. So I know they're working on an ancient, uh, ancient biobank so that, um, you know, they want to like mm-hmm. actually predict trait distributions in ancient British populations. So we are, we are so far beyond trying to like use 34 base pairs, uh, to see if we have like real data to actually doing, trying to do genome wide association stuff, which is mm-hmm. kind of weird. Cause I mean, you just have their bones, maybe. Uh, I mean, not having traits, I, I don't want to get into it. That's the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Right. But the ambitions are, the ambitions are, are pretty far out there. Um, yeah. I, so one thing that I, I want to ask you about, you know, cause, uh, there's a whole thing about, um, I, I think it's kind of faded away. Uh, but there was a period where a lot of all, a lot of the ancient DNA work was, was kind of a competition between people aligned with Pabo and people aligned with Willerslev. And so you have these like two camps of collaborators, uh, you know, because there's an extended, there's an extended universe of collaborators of archeologists. I mean, David Reich was initially mm-hmm. just a computational collaborator. I want to say just, but computational mm-hmm. collaborator is Fonte Pabo before he got his own thing up and running. And mm-hmm. so um, resources matter. And uh, I, Ancient DNA is this is kind of applied technology in a way, you know, in terms of the discovery, the commoditization, the scaling up. So it's kind of almost a technology story. Would you agree with that? Yes, yes, it is a technology story. Um, absolutely, because again, so here you have to have the resources to um, acquire the technology and use it, um, and also it it's very much. Um, a um a data driven and celebrity driven story which is one of the arguments i make so we we see um technology sometimes taking the upper hand and driving the research sometimes we see that it's the 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 data that like the specimens so what's available um because ancient dna research as as a field is very territorial uh, much like paleoanthropology um because here's the thing like there's only so many fossils and you've got to find them if they're even there and then there are only so many of certain um certain types of early humans. Um, and, um, so in the field, and I didn't get into this a lot in my book because it's pretty contentious, but you know, it's no, it's a secret, but also no secret out there that, um, people are not allowed to work on certain specimens, you know, Neanderthals, that's Savanti's territory and don't touch it. Um, 
And then other areas, you know, Greenland, um, other Arctic areas, you know, whatever yeah. that's that's eskies um david reich he can do ancient <laughs> he can do ancient stuff but you know no one else don't touch it so it's, um, yeah, yeah, it's almost sounds like colonialism here it's like and that's not a, it's right you're right it is it is um and there is there is a a funny but also um really disturbing argument to be made about that and i'm and i'm not trying to to um i'm not trying to accuse anyone of that but it is important when um, to look at the history of science um, and just the the history of the world, um, when we're talking about migrations, when we're talking about the development of science and who's doing it, to recognize um, who's doing it today and on what areas. And there have been other other people, um, other paleogeneticists who have made that argument that like this is just a modern day colonialization of uh, genomic data, and when if when it's on indigenous peoples, you know, that's, that shouldn't be their data. Um, it, not, mm. not indigenous people's data, but the researchers data. I mean, sure, sure. Um, so it's pretty complicated. I didn't get that in, into the book that much because, you know, that's another book. And yeah. also, and also I'm an early career researcher, so I, I'm not trying to, um, <laughs> I'm not trying to destroy myself before I start. Um, but yeah, that's a great point you, you bring up and it's a sure. very real one that, it is starting to be addressed. There's, you know, some ancient DNA ethics have been discussed and yeah. uh, we're moving in that direction, which um, is promising. So, uh, you know, I feel like also a lot of that issue has cropped up after 2015, which is kind of like, you know, a lot of your, uh, your research, mm-hmm. you said you kind of ended around then. So it was, like, mm-hmm. it was basically focusing more on like say the discovery phase of the second wave or the second hype cycle. And then now over the last, since like 2015 or so, a lot of things are being hashed out. So, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. an idea for a future book. I don't know if you're still interested in this topic, but you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, I want to ask just a few um, just closing questions. Uh, like, you know, not separate for the book, but, you know, kind of um, not necessarily connected to the book. So uh, what was the most surprising thing in your research? Because, I mean, this is out of your dissertation work. What was the most surprising fact that you discovered, uh, you know, just like, what, like, you know, what stood out to you? Oh, yeah. OK, so um, two things come to mind um, that one is that this idea of resurrecting dinosaurs you know, predates Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park. So the very first chapter is about this um, really um, th- this maverick figure who's who's kind of into everything. Um, his name's Charles Pellegrino, and he actually wrote an article and published it in Omni, which is a now defunct science science fiction magazine. Called um, the article was called Dinosaur Capsule. 1985. Um, and it basically put this Jurassic Park hypothesis out there. Um, and for whatever reason, um, it just fell flat. Um, it wasn't picked up. It wasn't talked about. And then um, Michael Crichton writes the book in 1990. And he's an established author, um, has a lot of best selling titles already. And it gets picked up before it's even out by Steven Spielberg because he worked with Spielberg on ER. And so when I was researching, I was reading the acknowledgments of Jurassic Park. One edition had no mention of Charles Pellegrino, but mentioned George Poinar and some of the other scientists who were doing some of this, um, looking at insects and amber and the exceptional preservation at the cellular level. So not necessarily getting DNA, but just looking at them. And, and so that, you know, acknowledging their research as inspiration for the basis of his book. Um, and then another, uh, uh, like probably I think six months or a year later, another publication of Jurassic Park, the acknowledgments actually say something a little bit different. They add Charles Pellegrino's name in it and um, acknowledge that he wrote about this in 1985. And what I find is that there is a big um, legal battle over Pellegrino and Poinar and Pellegrino accusing Poinar of hijacking his idea because he thinks because Poinar knew about it early on before he ever met Crichton. And it's this big, you know, who has, um, who has dibs on the Jurassic Park hypothesis. And so the main point here really is that, you know, it's, it's more than, it's not just drama. It's 
it shows that these ideas, this kind of speculative idea of what can we get DNA from, was not just an isolated idea. It was, you know, part of um, part of the culture, and it cropped up in a couple of different places, but it really just took flight with Crichton. And that's really interesting to note. Um, the other thing was just, uh, you know, I knew that ancient DNA research was a competitive field, but to really find out how competitive and how like personally and professionally difficult it was for many of the researchers um, of all the you know first generation, second generation, third generation of researchers. So really getting that mm-hmm. human element and, and also how candid everyone was with me. Granted, the interviews were anonymous, perhaps that's why, but they were very forthcoming with their experiences. And that was really surprising. And I was really appreciative of that because you don't usually get that. All right. So I'm going to tell a story. I think it's, it's far enough that I can tell this. Um, some people okay. will know, will know this, but uh, so in 2018, um, there was kind of like that piece about David Reich in the New York times magazine that was not very uh, favorable to him. Right. And um, I got a message from my a friend in Germany that uh, some people at certain branches of Max Planck were having a, after lab celebration <laughs> so <laughs> um i think it's it's far enough away that like you know it's not big i'm not like speaking out of school here but i, I literally because like and this was a friend who yeah. they don't work in ancient dna but they're near one uh-huh. of them and so they were like what's going on they're like oh they're just celebrating that that it came out because uh let's just say that like you know it's well known who the source is uh for some of those quotes were so, you know, uh, this is science. This is not like entirely shocking. It's not limited to ancient DNA. There's a lot of big right. egos. Although um, I would say in evolutionary genetics, you know, there's a stereotype, which I think is just true, that uh, hum- people who work in humans uh, have really sharp elbows. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, there's a lot of money, but there's also a lot of competition, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's just like the, the two go together. So we see that. Um, I want to like close out. I want to ask you about um, Mary Schweitzer's work. So I know a little bit about her, uh, you know, so she has like this really, really ancient DNA and ancient protein work, I guess. Um, she's at North Carolina State. That's where you are. And you did a lot of your education there and come back. You came back there. So talk about what she's been doing. And I, you know, I do know that there's arguments about like the, these results and it's a, from my understanding is pretty controversial, but I don't know too much about it. Can you talk about it a little bit? Yeah. So you're right. Her work is really controversial. Um, so um she started off in the in the early nineties, um, getting into the ancient DNA world, and quickly got out of it and went towards ancient proteins because, like you're saying, they're more robust, they're more stable. Um, sometimes they can be a lot more informative um, than DNA, and um, especially when you're looking at dinosaur material, which is, um, in, in her case, about you know seventy five million years old. Is you know sixty five to seventy five. That's what she was looking at. Um, from the late Cretaceous, um, Hell Creek formation in Montana. Um, and she was working with Jack Horner, who was also, um, that was her doctoral supervisor at Montana state who, and, um, Jack Horner was also the scientific consultant to Jurassic park, uh, the first several ones, not the most recent one. Um, but so she got away from the ancient DNA work and started doing the protein work. And in 2007, she, uh, published a huge, uh, landmark, article um, about um, extracting um, ancient proteins from um, a T-Rex specimen from Montana. And um, it's super contentious because, you know, that's the oldest kind of stuff out there. Um, But it's also contentious because um, no one is really trying to replicate it. Um, So it's really hard to say that you've got something when others aren't able to reproduce it or aren't willing to reproduce it. Um, So in a lot of ways, I think there are some people who are excited about her work, but um, skeptical of it. Um, And there's also a group of people who are not excited about her work and are really dismissive of it. Um, And then you have a handful that say, yeah, I think she did it. I think they did it, her team. Most recently in 2020, um, they, uh, she and some of her colleagues um, extracted um, material like proteins and chemical markers of DNA. So they did not say it was DNA, but it, it, 
behaved in such a way that DNA would. Um, but proteins and chromosomes from a 75 million year old a duck billed dinosaur, so two of them um, from Montana area. And so that's the most recent work. Um, and again, of course, the headlines are, you know, you know, bingo, dinosaur DNA, that sort of thing. So the Jurassic Park motive still comes through. Um, but again, the jury is out, you know, is this stuff real? Um, you know, in, in my opinion, whatever, which I don't want to say is a scientific opinion, but, you know, never say never. Um, you know, we've got environmental DNA that's 2 million years old now. So um, I don't know. Let's wait and mm-hmm. see. So that's well, where mean, we are right now. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, obviously it would be great. I mean, I mean People want to know as much as they can about the past with as many tools, mm-hmm. you know, as they, as they, um, you know, can use. So uh, it would be great uh, for it to be true. I didn't know too much about it. So the, all I know, or what I vaguely recall, is like uh, nobody could reproduce it or replicate it. And you're saying people mm-hmm. aren't trying to. So within science, you usually, I mean, honestly, at this point, like this is not like you know, 1850. You need a community. You need a community of researchers kind of working together and iteratively, you know, checking each other's work, kind of advancing the paradigm. And my impression here from what you're describing is there's not a big enough community that's exploring this topic. So it's hard to kind of judge. That's right. Yeah. And, and there there are some that are saying, like, we, we've tried, we can't get it. Um, but also it is it is such a small community, as in like, just like two or three labs. Um, and when we're talking about global science, that is, you know, that's, that's hardly anything. And so, yeah, you do, that's how science now, cause you, you know, modern science, it, it, it takes a village to, to show that you've got what you've got. Um, and other than that, you're a little bit at a standstill. Yeah. I mean, my, uh, <laughs> sometimes I joke that there's some GWAS papers that have more authors than, uh, samples. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you guys know what I'm talking about. If you ever, if you ever do like extended author list, like, whoa, the browser's collapsing. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, you worked on this. Uh, you know, dates up, date, you know, your, your book came out last year, Ancient DNA: The Making of Celebrity Science. Um, you've got uh, this position here at NC State, at the museum. Um, just you know, as we're going out, like, what are you working on? What are you excited about? What are you looking forward to? Yeah, well, right now I am. Uh, working in the paleontology lab, and I am running a public science project with eighth graders. So I get to work with teachers and students across North Carolina. And what we're doing is um, our paleontology team, we uh, drive tons of sediment um, about 66 million years old from the Hell Creek Formation in Montana. We drive it back to North Carolina, we clean it, we prep it, and we send um, samples of dirt out um, with lots of microfossils in them. So microfossils are teeny tiny fossils, like uh, small bones, shells, scales, and teeth um, from all the creatures that lived in that environment at the time. So we're talking about what kind of animals um, lived around the time of, you know, T-Rex and Triceratops, you know, to give everyone a reference point. And um, this is from the late Cretaceous. So the project is called Cretaceous creatures, and we send the sediment out. The students not only find their own microfossils that we haven't even looked at before, but they're also identifying them and submitting the data on online, and it creates this massive scientific database. So we've had, in this first year, we've had about 4,500 students across North Carolina participate. We have about uh, 2,000 data points of identified microfossils, and We're going to expand nationally in the next few years and then internationally, involving some students in um, probably South Africa, Bulgaria, um, perhaps Denmark. So it's a pretty big public science project. And that's that's what I'm doing these days. That's great. That's great. Um, You know, hopefully a new generation of scientists come out of this. I mean, things have really changed since the 1990s, I got to say. This is great. And it's exciting. You know, I, I we don't want to take the science for granted, but it's part of our lives now, and uh, that's for the good. You know, I mean, there is there is progress. Discoveries are still happening. It's not all uh, an eternal dialectic, right? Well, um, <laughs> thank you for your time, uh, Dr. Jones. Uh, everyone should check out the book Ancient DNA: The Making of uh, Celebrity Science, which again is not about individuals. Uh, just just want to like make that clear. But um, yeah, so um, I will see you around, and uh, this is a great conversation. Thanks. Nice to meet you.
This podcast for kids. This is my favorite.